Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and in knowledge and fulfill the very reason for which we are alive on this earth, which is to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we started on the study of anger. And this time, don't worry, I'm not going to shout so much. Now we're on the doctrine of anger. Now, anger is a mental attitude sin, and it is used as an anthropopathism related to divine judgment. And if you don't know what an anthropopathism is, I have over there on that desk about 10 CDs or MP3s. And if you have an MP3 player, it's lessons 1 through 18, and it describes a lot of the things that I'll be teaching today. Anger is a mental attitude sin, and it's used as an anthropopathism related to divine judgment. Anger in man is a sin, and I am surprised by how many people don't realize that anger is a sin. And we're going to study the difference between anger and righteous indignation. And it's not a fine line, it's pretty well delineated. In God, it expresses a change of policy in terms of a human frame of reference. Point two, as a mental attitude sin, anger expresses antagonism, hatred, exasperation, resentment, irrationality. It can be mental or emotional, and we looked at that with orge in the Greek, O-R-G-E, and that refers to mental angry, and then thumos in the Greek, T-H-U-M-O-S, and that is emotional anger, and emotional anger is always <coughs> irrational, and if you're uh, under emotional anger, you're really being stupid, because there's no thought in anger as an emotional sin. And in Ephesians 4.31, it talks about bitterness. And both mental and emotional anger are found in Ephesians 4.31, which makes bitterness a devastating sin to the soul. And we shouldn't walk around bitter. We are the children of God. We are royal family of God. And there is no place for bitterness in our life. We have a wonderful spiritual life to live. And bitterness is definitely not part of it. Point three, anger is a sin which motivates honor code violations. In the honor code, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. That's the honor code, the royal family honor code. And anger motivates us to violate that honor code because we will gossip about people. We don't want people to gossip about us, but we'll gossip about people. And that is the violation of the honor code. Or we will judge people. We don't want to be judged, but we'll judge other people. Violation of the honor code. Or we'll malign others. We don't want to be maligned, but we might malign others. That is a violation of the honor code. And this results often in chain sinning when we're angry. Usually it starts out as jealousy, which turns to anger, and then it goes on to other sins. And it's like chain smoking. You like one sin off of another. And that's the way it goes. Point four, anger is a mental attitude reaction. And uh, if it is unjustifiable, it becomes a reaction of antagonism, which makes it a sin. Uh, the reaction of irritation, exasperation, and irrationality. And justifiable, justifiable reaction is not irrational. And the Bible distinguishes between mental and emotional anger, as I said. If your right lobe is dominated uh, by anger, when you react, it's orge. And if your reaction is from emotional revolt, it's thumos, O-R-G-E, the mental anger, T-H-U-M-O-S, is the emotional anger. And both are unjustifiable reactions. And there are results to anger, as anger is a sin. Anger motivates jealousy and cruelty. This is found in Proverbs 27, verse 4. And a person cannot be angry without being cruel and unfair. If you've had, ever had an unfair boss who gets angry, it is a miserable condition to be under. And if you are in this anger of your boss or whatever, he's going to be cruel and unfair. But there's an unfairness in any place, any workplace. Why? Because all of us have sin natures. All of us at some point are going to be unfair to the people we love or just to people in general. And uh, we will be unfair because we have sin natures. We don't have the perfect justice of God. We must remember that God is always fair. Never question the fairness of God. God is always fair. Anger is related to stupidity. Ecclesiastes 7.9 Do not be hasty to be angry in your right lobe. For anger resides in the, bosoms, in the bosom of fools. 
and fools, that means you're stupid. If anger resides in stupid people. If you're hot-headed, you're getting stupid because there's no thought in it. Don't be hot-headed. Think. Thinking. That's what the spiritual life is all about. We have to have the thinking of Christ. And Christ definitely was not hot-headed. Now, he gave doctrine straight, and he was no wimp about it, and he chewed some people out, especially the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, and he chewed them out good, chewed them out so much that they got so angry with him, they hung him on a cross. So, uh, he was no wimp when it came to the Word of God. He chewed people out, but that, that was uh, righteous indignation, and there was no hatred behind it. He wanted those people to come to faith in him, and that's why he did that. So, anger is a sin from the old sin nature, and that's found in Galatians 5.20. Anger is a sin from the old sin nature found in Galatians 5.20. Anger is never an isolated sin, and that's found in Proverbs 29.22. Proverbs 29.22. An angry person stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered person abounds in transgression. In other words, they abound in sin. They live in carnality. They are going to be punished by the Lord, and eventually, if they continue in this manner, as we've been studying over the last few lessons, 1 John 5.16, they will die the sin face to face with death. That is, if they do not rebound. Now, I'm going to use another one of these overheads because it's new to me, and I like them. <laughs> and I'm going to use one of these uh, concerning uh, how anger, if you justify it all the time, what happens to you. Now this happens with all, if you justify any sin, this will happen eventually. But since we're uh, specifically studying angry, anger, let's take a look at this. All right, first of all, if you get angry with someone, and it's an uh, emotional anger, let's say, first of all, usually you're going to justify that anger. You're going to say, that person did me wrong. I have every right to be angry. So you justify yourself. So you're going down the wrong road. And you see this road here. Now, after you justify yourself, you could say to yourself, Ooh, I'm in the wrong. I need to rebound. And you say, Father, I was angry. And therefore, you're back in fellowship. And you see that road going there. It goes straight back to your spiritual life. But if you keep going, you will get to self-deception, meaning uh, you'll start lying to yourself. And you'll continue down this road, but you still have the opportunity through grace to use 1 John 1, 9 and name your sins to God and immediately you go back into your spiritual life. And you can keep going down this road, and eventually you're in self-absorption. And uh, this right here, self-absorption, the arrogant skill number three. And if you say, I have every right to be angry, and you're self-absorbed, and you're all concerned with yourself, and you're hypersensitive, that makes you hypersensitive, and you uh, take offense to just about everything, well, this eventually will lead to mental illness if you continue, and you will be a loser believer. You will not lose your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation, but you will become a loser in the spiritual life, and you will lose all the, the rewards that are available to you in heaven. But all the time that you're alive, you have this opportunity, 1 John 1, 9. So there's a solution to anger. anger. We're all going to get angry at some point, all of us. Uh, we're not sinless, and all of us will get angry. And then we have a solution to that. But if we don't use the solution, then we're in danger of 1 John 5.16, the sin face to face with death. So anger also, it's uh, described in the Bible, anger can destroy a nation. That's found in Amos 1.11. So decrees the Lord, for, the, for three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion because his anger raged continually and he maintained his anger forever. In other words, he never rebounded. The country never, the, the vast majority of the people in the country never uh, rebounded. They never named their sins to God. In the Old Testament, there was not First John 1, 9, but they did acknowledge their sins to God just as David acknowledged his sins to God when Nathan rebuked him and he realized that he had been in the wrong. You see, David had been going down that road that was up there for a long time and then finally he was able to acknowledge his sin and he was forgiven. And that's another subject for another time. We'll probably do that during the uh, conference week. We'll study David and Job and Elijah and all of those Old Testament heroes who utilized 
the faith rest drill. And by then we'll be on the faith rest drill. And then we're moving from the milk of the word and we're actually getting a little bit of meat out of it. It's still milk and meat. And then eventually we'll get to all the meat of the word and that'll be wonderful because that means we'll be growing in grace. Anger is associated with grieving the Holy Spirit. That's found in Ephesians 4.30-31 through 31, where it says, Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Your Bible says do not, but it's stop because do not, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit at some point. When you sin, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit, and the Bible tells us to stop. And how do we stop? Very simple. Name your sins to God, and then you are uh, filled with God the Holy Spirit again, and you can resume your spiritual life, forgetting those things that are behind and moving forward toward the high ground. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be removed from you together with all evil. That's Ephesians 4.30 and 31. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit, the God by whom you have been sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be removed from you together with all evil. Evil. Point seven, anger is a violation of the royal family honor code, Colossians 3.8. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Abusive speech is not cuss words. Abusive speech is when you malign gossip and judge someone, and that means you're being abusive toward someone. Anger this is point eight. Anger hinders effective prayer. First Timothy two eight. Therefore I desire that men in every place pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and without dissension. If you have anger in your soul, you, your prayers will not go no higher than this ceiling. You can pray all day long, and if you're in a state of anger, God will not hear your prayers. But God does hear your, hear your prayers when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, and we'll be studying prayer shortly and uh, after we get through this and the emotional uh, type sins we will get to prayer and other essential things for our spiritual life point nine anger results in self induced misery you know when you're angry you're not happy you're making yourself miser miserable and God might not even be punishing you yet when you get angry you're miserable you're not happy not happy at all and then uh, if you stay angry, angry long enough, God adds to that. And you become even more miserable and more miserable until finally maybe you wake up and use 1 John 1, 9 and get with the spiritual life. Anger is, the tr is a source of change sinning, as I have said, Hebrews 12, 15. And this is uh, in there, that's hypocritical, hidden anger. And anger causes misery to those in your periphery. Uh, what's that saying? If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? Well, if mom is angry, more than likely everybody in the periphery is going to be kind of upset too. And that's just the way it works. It spreads. It's like a gangrene disease. Somebody's angry, sore thumb at a party. Oh, well, it just kind of affects the whole mood of the whole situation. So anger ca causes misery to those in your periphery, and that's found in Amos 1.11, Proverbs 21.19, Proverbs 22.24, Proverbs 25.24, and Proverbs 29:22. That's Amos 1:11, Proverbs 21:19, 22:24, 25:24, and 29:22. Anger. We'll look at we'll look at anger in the New Testament, Ephesians 4:26. And if you want to turn there, that would be fine. Ephesians 4:26. Now this is the corrected translation of the verse from uh, Colonel R.B. Thame, a genius in the Greek language. The verse is correctly translated, although you may have become angry, in spite of that, stop sinning. In other words, uh, you become angry and then stop sinning, 1 John 1, 9. That's all it's saying. And this is quoted from Psalms 4.4, 4, which, uh, uh, which teaches David's righteous indignation at the revolt of his son Absalom, and his temptation to anger was checked. And this is where David said, Tremble with anger, yet do not sin. In other words, he was righteously indignant against his son who had started a revolution against him just as he, just as he had had a revolution against uh, God when he committed adultery and murder. So uh, as part of his punishment, Absalom tried to take over his kingdom and uh, David trembled with anger, yet did not sin. This was part of righteous 
indignation. If anger continues and you have bitterness or vindictiveness, your vindictiveness will come out either verbally or in some form of retaliation or revenge. In other words, you can't keep anger bottled inside for too long. Eventually, it'll show itself, and you will lash out at somebody. And that's part of sin. And then uh, that's compounding sin upon sin because you go from being anger, angry, and then you might even go to some type of violence. And your anger gets transferred to violence, and sin adds to sin. When maltreated, never let reaction to maltreatment become sin. Because if you retaliate, then your reaction becomes anger. In other words, uh, don't react to people. Uh, Don't let people get you angry. Uh, You have to leave it in the Lord's hands, and that's about as basic as I'll put it. Now, it's something called impersonal love that we'll study later. But right now, just understand that if somebody uh, tries to get you angry or does you wrong in some way, just leave it in the Lord's hands. The Lord will take care of it. What does the Lord say? Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And if you leave it in his hands, he can repay far better than we ever could. So it is, it is possible to respond to unfairness apart from sin. You can be angry because of maltreatment, of gossip from others, and yet put the matter in the Lord's hands. But uh, And that's uh, Ephesians 4.26 that's, that's not what is taught in Ephesians 4.26. When maltreated, never let reaction to maltreatment become sin. If you retaliate, then your reaction becomes anger, and then you violate yourself, the royal honor code. So if you react to somebody who is uh, making you angry, if you react to that, then you are sinning, and that reaction makes you sin. So when mama's unhappy, you should still be happy, and that's the point. So, uh, if somebody's angry around you, don't let it affect you. Now, let's move on from anger. We've gotten enough points on anger, and there are principles related to anger. But uh, I meant to go a lot farther today, but I got held up. And now we're going to move on to emotion. Now, emotion has its uh, rightful place in us. Emotion is part of our body. You see, we were made in the image of God, and a lot of people think that means God looks like a man. No, God doesn't look like a man. Uh, God is spirit. That's what the Bible says. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. So how are we made in the image of God? Our souls are. Our souls are made in the image of God. So within us is the image of God in our souls. Now, our souls don't have emotion in our souls because God does not have emotion. Now, the Bible ascribes emotion to God just so we can understand uh, his thoughts about things. But God is not emotional. Uh, God is just always happy. And you say happy is an emotion. Well, it's part of the essence of God. His happiness is part of his essence, and it's never changed. So God never goes on emotional swings like humans do. And that's because emotion is in our body. It can't be in our souls because we were made in the image of God. And since we were made in the image of God, our souls don't have emotion. But within our bodies, we do have emotion. So, point one, emotion is part of our bodies. It's in our body. And just as the sin nature is in the body, emotion is in the body. However, the sin nature being in the body can only tempt. But emotion in the body can be used properly or it can be used improperly. Emotion is a reflection of what resides in your soul. Emotion is a reflection of what resides in your soul. And this is what the Bible calls cardia, heart, and that refers to the stream of consciousness. And one reason we we know that emotion is in the body and not in the soul is because emotion can be stimulated by such things as drugs and alcohol. You put drugs or alcohol in your body, your emotions can be stimulated. Too much alcohol, and uh, you've heard of crying drunks, well, that's because their emotions have been stimulated and they're on the depressed side of the alcohol, so they start weeping. And that's uh, part of the body reaction to the alcohol or uh, certain drugs, cocaine or whatever, a speed, something like that, that stimulates you. It will stimulate your emotion, which is in your body. Point two, emotion only functions properly in our lives when it is subordinate to the thought of our souls. You see, the Bible tells us to have the thinking of Christ. And when we have the thinking of Christ, our emotions act as a responder. It responds to those things, those wonderful things. For example, 
uh, this beautiful day outside right now. You could respond to that emotionally. Take a big, deep breath of that country air and say, wow, what a wonderful, beautiful day. Or go down to the lake and relax, go fishing, do something like that. And your emotions respond to that. And that's a normal response. And emotions are made for normal response. Or you could hear the Star Spangled Banner, and if you have any patriotism about you, you, your eyes will well up with a bit of tears. Well, that's good emotion. That's part, and that's what God has given us in our bodies so that we can use it as a responder and so that it, uh, it makes life enjoyable. Uh, people who try to say they have no emotion, well, that would be very, very boring. Uh, you can't enjoy music without emotion. You can't enjoy anything without emotion, and that's part of God's gift to us in the body, but it has to have its proper place. And emotion must always be subordinate to our thought. If we let emotions run rampant over our souls, then uh, we'll see what happens. Expressions of the point three, well, let's finish point two. Emotions only function properly in our lives when it's subordinate to the thought in our souls. And the Bible tells us we must have the thinking of Christ. And this means our emotions must remain in their rightful place, acting as a responder rather than a reactor in our lives. So in other words, uh, the Pentecostal movement is way out of line. The Pentecostal movement where they uh, raise their hands and run around, and they have something now I saw on television called a holy laughter. Well, that's a bunch of holy crap. There's nothing... <laughs> I've, never heard, I've never heard of such insanity in my life of people running around, uh, going through all this emotional hoops, that's in your body. That's not glorifying to the Lord. That's in the flesh. What if you're a paraplegic and you can't move and you're sitting in church? Are they going to come up to you and say, Brother, why aren't you filled with the ghost and running? Well, he has no legs or arms. He's a paraplegic. You see, it's in the flesh. And God's not impressed by our flesh or what we can do in the flesh. God's not impressed by our emotions that is in the flesh. Our emotions is for us to... Uh, appreciate. So God's not impressed with that. You know what God is impressed with? What's in your soul? God is impressed with your knowledge of doctrine. God was impressed because David meditated on his word both day and night. God was not impressed because you run up and down an aisle and scream and uh, allegedly speak in tongues and act like a moron. This is royal family of God. This is not a place for nitwits and twerps. People who do that are really, uh, they're way, way out of line. And what they have done is what the Bible calls, they've made emotion their God. And it's like uh, they get an emotional high on a Sunday and they go home and all week, uh, and then they, have, they get let down by that emotional high, and then all week uh, they're living in sin. So there's nothing to be had out of that except uh, a little stimulation. And you can get stimulation from alcohol or drugs in the same way. So these people are uh, way out of line. Emotions can be either good or bad. <clears throat> but let's take a look at uh, point three. Expressions of love toward another can oftentimes be no more than emotion controlling our thoughts, especially among teenagers when they, we all go through it, when we first have our first love or whatever, that's just our emotions controlling our thought. When we're teenagers, we don't know you in, for the most part. Now, there are some teenagers who grow up spiritually who know a lot about love. But for the most part, teenagers know nothing about love. And it's just an emotional response, and they let their emotions get ahead of them, and uh, they think emotion is love. And love has a lot more to do than just emotion. And this is part of the reason why the divorce rate in America is 50%. It's because people give you bad advice and say, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Well, people have been doing that, and now we have a 50% divorce rate. So don't follow your heart. Follow your thoughts. If you see somebody, think about that person. Think about what they are. Are they, are they growing in grace? Are these people interested in the Word of God? Well, that's the kind of person you want. You want somebody who has the same values you have. That's who you want to marry. Now, if you marry just because of good looks or something, then uh, that doesn't last very long because once the little lady lag nags you enough, you don't care how she looks anymore. You just want her to get out of the house. And that's just the way it is. So those good looks only last so long. And that's part of emotion when we uh, do that. And true love is not really emotional. This is called virtue love in the Bible. And this is when we have a personal love for God and an impersonal love for mankind. 
and we haven't studied this yet. It's part of the advanced study, but I'll just give you a preview of coming attractions by throwing those words out there. And uh, that type of love is not swayed by emotions. 1 Corinthians 13.4 Virtue love endures with fortitude under, under pressure. It is kind, and that means it treats others with grace. It is kind and not jealous. Jealousy will destroy love in a hurry. Actually, Proverbs says jealousy is stronger than love. If, uh, if you're uh, dating some man and he's the jealous type, well, you're in trouble because he can't have love if he's always jealous of, of you and what you're doing. That's not true love. And you might say, well, he must really love me as jealous as he is. Well, that's jealousy is part of the sin nature. And a person who gets jealous all the time, that's part of their weakness, and they need to grow up spiritually. But uh, that person who's jealous all the time of somebody else is definitely not ready for marriage yet because it will ruin the marriage. So point four, emotions can be either good or bad. And when you function under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, the emotions in your, in your body remain subordinate. And that means they respond to stimuli rather than react to stimuli. Uh, if you are controlled by your emotions, you're going to react to everything. You're going to become what's called hypersensitive. You're going to be hypersensitive to what everybody says to you, and you're going to take it the wrong way. And that's why a lot of people walk out of churches. They get hypersensitive about what is said in the pulpit. And I don't know, uh, most of you I don't know personally. Of course, I know my family, and uh, some of you are my friends. But most of you I don't know personally, and I'm not preaching to you personally. I'm just giving you the Word of God as these message are, uh, messages are made before I even know who comes in here. So if I step on your toes, well, I'm sorry, but that's just the Word of God. I don't even know you. I'm not here to insult you in any way. But it happens, and that's hypersensitivity, and that's why sometimes people just walk out and never come back. And I hope some of these people that do that never do come back. So, when you are functioning under the control of the sin nature, the emotions in your body no longer respond to stimuli. This is point five. Did I do point four? Point five. When you are functioning under the control of the sin nature, the emotions in your body no longer respond to stimuli, but they react to it. The emotions, in essence, control your soul. Therefore, you will live a life characterized by wide emotional swings. And one day you'll be happy, the next day you'll be sad. And these wide emotional swings, perpetuated over a long period of time, can cause such disorders as bipolar and other disorders. And you need to take medication for that if it's gone that far. But that's, uh, that's no reason to be uh, no reason to be ashamed about that. It, it happens. We are all sinners. It happens in our sin nature. And if we have to take medication for some emotional instability, by all means, take it. Because sometimes, while it might be related to the choices you make, sometimes there are disorders and brain diseases that are completely apart from what you uh, have done to yourself. There are uh, diseases in the brain that can function the brain. There could be too much fluid buildup, and it can make you a little wacky. Well, you need to get medicine on it, and that's not necessarily your fault. But in a lot of cases, it is your fault because you have been under these wide emotional swings, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, and eventually that ends up in bipolar, and you have to get on medicine. And if you have to, take it. I am definitely not against medicine. Medicine today has reached its peak, and I hope it keeps going because it has kept a lot of people sane, and they can come in here and after they take their medicine and listen to the Word and learn something. And that's a wonderful thing, and it's nothing to be ashamed about. Point six, when God created Adam, he was created without a sin nature. However, within Adam's body was the function of emotion, and we know that emotion was in Adam's body because when God created Eve, as soon as Adam woke up, the first words out of his mouth were, At last! <laughs> you see, he was emotional. He had an emotional response. So we know Adam had emotion, and since Adam at this point had no sin nature, he had not ate of the fruit yet, he had perfect emotion. A wonderful responder. He could respond to every all the wonderful things in the garden, all the animals, all the wonderful fruits he had to eat, 
And back then, the animals weren't turned over to a mad vine, so he could go up to a tiger or a lion or a bear and just, <coughs> just pet it, and a big fluffy bear, and just pet it. That's his pet. And it wouldn't do anything to him because uh, he had not yet sinned. So that's part of it. And I know this is getting a little mundane and arduous point by point, and we'll go over some more points, but to break up the monotony a little bit before we break, turn in your Bibles to Second Samuel 19.1. Second Samuel 19, verse 1. Now this is an example of somebody letting their emotions take control of them. And in this case, it would seem, uh, well, you would almost not be normal if the emotions didn't take over in this case. But uh, doctrine can about solve anything. But uh, this is David under extreme stress. And we'll see that in a moment once you get turned there. Second Samuel 19.1 When King David saw Absalom's body, you see Absalom had started a revolution against David. And Absalom had beautiful, long hair. As a man, he had beautiful, long hair. And he was riding his horse. And uh, he was running away. And suddenly that beautiful hair got caught in a tree. And he hung there. And then he was vulnerable, of course, hanging there, swinging by his hair. And so and if, so, uh, what happened was Joab came up stabbed him in the heart three times and killed him. Now, David had told uh, Joab, don't, don't kill my son. But Joab had enough sense about him to know that this man who had started the revolution would continuously be a troublemaker and he had to be eradicated. So he went against King David because he knew that King David at this point was acting emotionally irrational. So when King David saw Absalom's body, he became agitated and went up to the room over the gate and wept and wept. As he went along, he said, My son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Absalom, my son, my son. Now, of course, he had just lost his son. He's being very irrational and emotional, which would be a normal response, but he's the king, and he has some extra responsibility. You see, his army had just wiped out the army of Absalom, and the army was victorious. The last thing his army wanted to see was the king crying over a victory. Why is he so upset when we just had a victory? Oh, but you see, his son was involved, so he starts crying, and this is emotions taking over his uh, soul. And you can feel sorry for David. He'd just lost his son, who had started a revolution against him, and it would be normal to feel sorry for him, to lose his son, the, the father and son relationship. Actually, Absalom started out as being David's favorite son. So he had an awful time with this. But what happened was he let emotion get in control of his thinking. And as king, he needed to be thinking all the time because he, was, he had a great responsibility. <laughs> then Joab was told, The king is weeping and mourning over Absalom. And the victory on that day was turned to mourning as far as all the people were concerned. In other words, David let down the people of Israel. They had just had that great victory, and now all the people are sad because they see their king weeping over a victory. So it's as, it's as if uh, David, uh, what do they say, snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory. That's what David did, and that's what he did from his emotional revolt. So as far as the people were concerned, they might as well have lost the battle. And then it continues... For the people heard on that day, the king is grieved over his son. On that day, the people stole away to go to the city, the way people who are embarrassed steal away in fleeing from battle. In other words, David's emotional revolt embarrassed the whole country. The whole country of Israel had become embarrassed, and they had to leave with their head hung down in shame, even though David's army was victorious. So you see the impact of the emotional revolt of the soul. When emotion takes over your thought, your thought, and then when that happens, a lot of destructive things can happen. And we can feel sorry for David for this, but in fact, he is out of line because emotion has taken over his soul. And you would think, well, no wonder his son's dead. Well, yes, 
but he does have a responsibility still. 19.5, the king covered his face and cried out loudly, My son Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. So Joab visited the king at his home, and he said, Today, now this is Joab, this takes some uh, cojones to go up to David, the king of Israel, and to rebuke him. I mean, the king has a lot of power. So Joab goes up to David and he says, uh, Look, today you've embarrassed all of your servants who have saved not only your life today, but the lives of your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your concubines as well. In other words, you're crying right now over your son, but if we had let him go, he would have killed everyone in your family, including yourself, so snap out of it. This is what Joab is saying to David. And then he continues with his rebuke. You seem to love your enemies and hate your friends, for you have as much as declared today that leaders and servants don't matter to you. In other words, Joab is saying, you have a lot of people under your care, and they are embarrassed about this, and their feelings are hurt. You need to lead them and get out of your emotional revolt. In other words, stop letting the emotion run your soul. And then he says, I realize now that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, it would be all right with you. Now this is sarcasm. He knew it wouldn't be all right with him, but he uses this to snap him out of it. So then Joab issues an order to the king, and this is something else. So get up now and give some encouragement to your servants, for I swear by the Lord that if you don't go forth, not a single man will spend the night with you tonight. This disaster will be worse for you than any disaster that has come on you from your youth to the present time. In other words, David, if you don't start thinking about the situation, you're going to lose your kingdom. You're going to lose the respect of your people. And uh, everything is going to be worse for you from here on out and not better. And then, once David was given some common sense, David is always being humble, uh, changed his mind about the situation, finally got his head screwed on straight, and straightened the situation out in which... Uh, and the kingdom was saved, and the kingdom went on in great prosperity, not, on, not only under David, but under Solomon, the prosperity continued to increase. And this was all a part of David's spiritual impact. And you, sitting here today, before we close, I want to tell you that you, sitting here today, have the potential for wonderful spiritual impact, just as David did. You see, uh, Israel was in some dire straits before David came along, and David was a great man of Bible doctrine. In other words, he loved the Word of God. And because of that, all through the Old Testament, it says uh, this king was great, but not as great as his father, David. And so, David, in his spiritual maturity, and I'm looking for something here to show this to you, but I might have to print one out, dealing with the impact that you can have. Well, here's something about it. We looked at this in the first message. Right here, invisible impact of invisible hero. Now, in the Old Testament, David was a visible hero, and he was visible because he was the king. But you, sitting here today as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have an impact, a tremendous impact on your country simply by listening to the Word of God and putting it in your soul and meditating on the Word of God both day and night, just as David did. And God honors that. God honors the Word of God in people's souls. And then, blessings. You see, David's cup overflowed. And if we fill our cup with the Word of God, our cup will overflow. And when it does, blessings come out from all around us. Our family will be blessed by us. Our community will be blessed by us. Our schools our uh, sports, whatever sports, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, sports in, in sports they go all the way to the Super Bowl and oftentimes they get there because somebody on the team has reached spiritual maturity. This has happened many times before. Or the coach was in spiritual maturity. And there's great impact from your spiritual life and your cup overflowing. So therefore the importance of Bible doctrine, it should be number one in your life. Now, we live in a time we could be home right now watching some pretty good television shows, but we're not. We're here. And that's because we need to organize our life around Bible doctrine. 
It should be number one, and we should take in the Word of God daily. And eventually, I plan to be here daily at 7 o'clock. Now, we, I will be the first week in April. Just a reminder, there's a conference the first week in April, and that will be at 6.30, starting at 6.30, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday, it'll be Saturday night at the movies, and I have a movie picked out for us to watch in which doctrinal application can be made. And then we'll resume our regular schedule twice on Sunday. And once I get some things straightened out in my personal life, I'm going to be here Monday through Friday and twice on Sunday. That'll be seven times. That way you can get doctrine every day if you so desire. And that would be wonderful because we need to grow in grace so that we can have this invisible impact. And it goes all the way up to the country in which our whole country can be blessed. And believe me, our country needs some blessing right now as we've been at war with terrorists now for what, about four years. And it's going to continue. And actually, I, it, there is no end in sight to this war. But there might be if we all grow up spiritually. If we all grow up spiritually, the blessings that overflow could end all of this and the trips could come home, and then we could uh, live again in peace. And that is, if you grow up spiritually. Now, we have to fight this war right now. I'm not saying bring the troops home. We have to fight it. In the Bible, all through the Bible, they had to fight wars. In fact, the whole book of Numbers is about how to enlist people in the army. And we need to be fighting this war, and we need to win it, and that's freedom through military victory. And right now we seem to be doing a good job, but we never know when God might want to lower the boom on us if we don't get with the spiritual life. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege this morning to live in freedom to where we can assemble ourselves together and learn the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the portion of the Word which we study today so that we might glorify you. And may we stuff the Word of God into our souls so that our cup may overflow and we might have blessings uh, to uh, be around us and to have blessings upon this country and to hold back the storm clouds of terrorism. And Father, we pray for our President. May you give him wisdom and counsel in this time of war. May you confuse the counsel of, his in of our enemies, and may you give great counsel to our president and give him the wisdom to make the right decisions as our country is in so desperate need of it. And therefore, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and take the portion of the word that we have studied this morning and make it a source of blessing and challenge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.